So welcome to the Re-Energizing Your Teaching and Encouraging Active Learning Using Creative Assessments. So I think it sounds like everybody's um, sound and audio is working. So um, hopefully if it's not, um, you're looking at the screen and you can send us a chat or you can try to exit and re-enter. But looks like we're doing okay. All right, so today's workshop is going to be very discussion oriented and we definitely wanna hear from you. Um, however you are most comfortable communicating, um, and it's entirely up to you. You can either um, hop on the microphone or you can also use the text chat. So if you're new to Blackboard Collaborate, at the bottom right corner of your screen, you'll see kind of a purple thumbnail. You can click on that and um, a window will expand. There is a little uh, chat bubble and uh, that's where you can use the text chat, or again, if you'd just rather turn on your microphone at any time, that is at the uh, bottom center of your screen. So my name is Megan Holt. I'm an Instructional Support Coordinator in the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning, and joining me is my colleague, Dr. Yvonne Johnson. She's our Multimodal Teaching Coordinator. And uh, you have both of our contact information up on the screen, so please feel free to contact either of us at any point. You can always send us an email. And I think we can just kind of jump in. Now, I know that Yvonne and I both have some um, ideas that we've gathered to share with you, but um, if you have some creative ideas that you would like to share as well, uh, we definitely want to hear what you've been implementing in your classroom. So, um, but we're trying to address maybe a problem or a concern, and um, as you can see, it's up on the screen right now. You've noticed maybe that your students are kind of lagging, they're, they're struggling, just barely getting by. Um, so how can you use maybe technology to boost their, part their uh, participation and also just to help them achieve those outlined uh, course learning objectives? So. I don't know, should we jump in? Is that, did I go too fast? And you can post your thoughts, as Megan said, you can post your thoughts in the in the chat or turn on your microphone because we have a small group. So it, it would be nice if we could have a little discussion. And so what is your perspective of type um, engagement in your classes now, the level of engagement? Have you seen any challenges with that? You know, it's kind of a, a tricky question. Right now we're in a pandemic, but it sounds like we're gonna go back to face to face in the fall, so. And we have people from different disciplines. Bill, you work in music. Um, what's your perspective on in student engagement now in your classes? We lost him. Oh yeah, his um, <laughs> microphone was on. I'm here. I was type. I was typing, but I can ah. talk. I guess that's okay too. Whatever you prefer. Um, I don't. There's no teaching allowed in the in music in the summer, so I can't talk about right this second. But um, and most of, most of my teaching is one on one, so they they have to be engaged all the time. But I do teach classes, and sometimes um. It is hard to get them to to speak in a class uh, with other people. So one thing you could that occurred to me that can be done is to have them um, talk, engage with each other to talk with each other about a topic or uh, comment on a per musical performance that they heard or their just their opinions. So rather than just the teacher talking or talking to me, they talking with each other can sometimes help, I think. I love this idea. I love the idea that students are, are teaching other students. And I see we just had another person join us. So welcome to the session. You, you didn't miss too much. Um, we're just kind of getting a maybe a feel for how we think our students are doing right now. You know, what's their level of engagement? Um, anyone else has anything that they want to chime in with? 
So we've heard from music. What other disciplines do you all work in? Um, Nahal, I know you work in interdisciplinary health sciences. Chris and Robert, what, what disciplines do you work in? Uh, I work in, uh, Chris Hill here, I work in uh, kinesiology. Okay. So what about engagement in kinesiology these days? Uh, if I'm being honest, it's probably pretty low overall, um, if, speaking for myself, but that may be a function of me doing more asynchronous uh, because I like to maximize flexibility for everyone involved, especially in an online environment. Uh, so I have kids like logging in, you know, like to take a quiz or something, maybe an hour before it's due or whatever. Uh, my summer class actually had a kid log in to like yesterday to blackboard it all. So that was kind of interesting. Um, so yeah, that's my description. Okay, so working with the asynchronous you think might have an impact. Okay. Okay, thank you. And Nahal and Robert, what do you all think about engagement? Uh, yeah, um, I will, I'm actually an incoming master's student and I will be to my first class and in, in the fall, um, I will be to um, the communications department. So I'm just trying to just, just kind of feel everything out. Um, most likely I'll be teaching a public speaking class. So I know that's really hard for many, many, many students. Just I'm just trying to figure out different ways to engage them because I could lecture about it but actually, but I I feel, but the purpose is to get them to actually try and be able to get over their 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 stage fright. So that's in here. Excellent, welcome. All right. And how about you? Well, hi everybody. I'm not sure if I totally understood the question. To um, I just logged in, but um, I would try to, um, I mean, I try to assign those kind of assessments that uh, engage students in such a way that they understand what they're actually doing that assessment and how they can apply in, in um, daily life, in their, in, their, in their daily lives, in their future career. Um, I mean, I found a couple of assessments. For example, I'm teaching uh, Rehab 200, which is called Disability in Society. So those, um, I mean, I love to assign those kind of assessments that I actually uh, teach students what does accessibility mean, for example. So those assessments, I believe, would let students to understand why they actually doing that doing that assessment. I, I hope that I answered the question. I just logged in. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Well, I think we can um, kind of divide this up. I, I know I'll, I'll start us off with assessments and then uh, you know, Yvonne will probably take over and, and uh, give you a couple of clues um, of things that we found for activities. Um, and of course, we, we would love to hear more about what you're doing in your individual courses. Um, I, I think what you're saying, a lot of what you're saying is that uh, we have noticed that some of our students are kind of lagging behind. Maybe they're getting burnt out. Um, could be a lot of different things going on right now. And so when we're looking at types of assessments to engage our students, How's my audio doing? Your audio sounds fine. Um, okay. Bill, I think I might need to ask you to turn off your microphone. I think you're getting a little feedback. Oh, all right. I'll do that. Okay, thank you. Oh, is that what it was? I thought it was me. Okay. Um, no problem. We, that happens to all of us all the time. <laughs> Um, as far as assessments go, I, I think of assessments, you know, at least in this context, um, maybe as some type of um, 
maybe like a, a graded activity that you can implement in your course. And so for me, when I, I started thinking about this, uh, it's not just what kind of assessments can you use, but how do you implement them? So I came up with kind of a, a series of different ideas just to get your mind going. Um, and I have some suggestions for what we have access to at NIU and how you could implement them into your course. And um, so I'm hoping you'll I'll help me out and expand on some of these. Uh, but you can see, I, I think I threw up a, about five different options here. So um, for instance, the one at the top, concept mapping. Um, it's not maybe that concept mapping is uh, brand new to us. I don't think we need to you know, reinvent the wheel per se. Um, but what I did find, and I will be happy to send these to you um, in a follow-up email after this workshop, is that there are some resources out there about how to teach uh, concept mapping to students at the college level. So I found one um, YouTube tutorial, and it's only about like five minutes long, but a college instructor actually walks her students through a concept mapping exercise um, with a real writing um, topic. So I, I thought that was pretty wild. You know, you could even just share this link with your students. It kind of shows them the expectations, how to do it, um, how much um, content they need to put in there, um, how to expand their maps. Um, so that I thought was really helpful. Uh, she also talks about making sure if you give a concept mapping um, exercise to your students to um, probably attach a grading rubric to it so that your students understand um, what you expect, how long should their concept map be, you know, how in depth, um, what kind of material do they need to include, uh, that type of thing. And um, lastly, I found another resource that talks about, um, and it's geared towards students, but um, it actually tells your um, students how to build a concept map in uh, Google Docs, which I really liked because, um, you know, even in a face-to-face -face setting, you can still go paperless. And uh, this is something that your students can submit electronically via Blackboard. Um, so I, I thought this was like a great exercise. There's all these free resources right out there um, that'll kind of walk your students through the expectation of, of what is concept mapping, why do we do it, um, you know, how does it help us, you know, plan our writing or, you know, project. So um, I, was, I was pretty excited about it. I, I loved that there's a tutorial that walks us through Google Docs um, and it's, basically geared for your students. It, it shows them how to do it from the student perspective. So that was one. Um, has anybody ever tried concept mapping or um, have, has anyone ever done one through Google Docs? I've done concept mapping in when I was a student. Um, it wasn't through Google Docs. Um, we actually just kind of, well, we actually just drew them, but the way that it was used was for us to show our understanding of the readings. So we were assigned these readings and then we were supposed to draw a concept map to represent um, the meaning to us of those readings. But we didn't do it in Google, uh, Google Docs. That's a tremendous resource, great resource. Um, Megan. Great. I, I mean, it's just one of those assessments where your students actually physically have to get involved. They have to take their ideas that are in their head and, and physically display it so that you can um, see kind of what their level of understanding is. Um, and again, it's a nice break from always constantly being the lecturer. So um, that was one of the, you know, kind of activities or graded assessments that I really liked. Um, another one that I had was video blogs. Now, video blogs are I think a lot of fun. Um, hopefully your students feel the same way. One thing that we know for certain um, with students, and not just NIU students, but with college students in general, is that increasingly they are accessing their um, classroom from their mobile devices, whether that's, um, you know, their cell phone, it could even be, you know, a tablet or a Chromebook, uh, something like that. So, um, one of the nice things that NIU has to offer is um, we do have our our new video platform, Kaltura, um, but it does also come with um, a free mobile app 
and it's actually pretty easy to use. Um, it, it was far nicer than anything I anticipated, so it was a pleasant surprise. Uh, but this is a great way that you can ask your students to do some type of a reflection um, and record it as a small video um, upload directly to their Blackboard class. So um, an example that I actually saw, uh, which I thought was pretty wild, was at the start of the pandemic, remember uh, all the masks were um, kind of in high demand, they were none to be had, and so then you had all of our first responders, uh, teachers, you know, people in the healthcare profession, uh, they were trying to come up with their own uh, personal protective equipment, and they got um, pretty creative with things that they would try to do, um, maybe to, to shield themselves from any like, airborne particles, if you will. Um, and so what one teacher did is uh, they asked their students to locate some of these videos that were on YouTube of people creating their own personal protective equipment. Um, and these were students that were in the healthcare profession. Um, and the students were asked to evaluate these, these creations. You know, were they were they really effective? Um, which ones were better than others? Um, you know, and it was just kind of a, a neat exercise um, where they were using their own knowledge, their own healthcare knowledge, um, and evaluating what people were doing just to try to stay safe. So, um, you know, it, it was all about kind of bringing in current events. Um, it was something that they could all do from a socially distanced classroom. Um, so, what's a Lots of good things there that you can work with. Um, if you ever have any questions about how to integrate Kaltura into your classroom, let me know. I, I've worked with that pretty extensively, so I can help you set that up if that's kind of um, an assessment that you would like to use. Um, let's see. Feel free at any time if any of you want to chime in I, the things you're doing as well. Since I haven't heard anything, um, another one that I came up with were Kaltura quizzes. So um, again, it kind of goes hand in hand with the video blogs, just because it would use um, our, our subscription to Kaltura, our video platform. But again, that's open and accessible. Um, yes, I, I see a question here in the chat. Does NIU still support and use Kaltura? Absolutely. Um, we still have our license with them. Uh, we plan to continue to extend that and offer it um, indefinitely, as far as I know. So um, it's open to staff, students, uh, faculty. So everybody has access to it. Uh, one of the nice things about Kaltura is you can um, upload any of your uh, videos or videos that you have recorded, and then you can turn it into an interactive quiz, which I think a lot of people love. Um, you know, you can take your recorded lecture. I, we've often heard faculty ask, well, how do I know if my students watched my lecture? Well, you could turn it into a, an interactive quiz, and it's up to you if you want it to be graded or ungraded, uh, but then uh, as your students are watching your recorded lecture, um, they will be prompted to pause and answer a question. And you could make it a multiple choice question. You could make it a short answer question. It's really up to you. Um, and then the video will progress and they'll keep going. So um, it is a really handy feature. Um, you know, this is how you can ensure that students really are um, following along, watching the video content. And certainly when we were all involved in remote learning. Um, that was a really big feature, but um, you know, it still works well even in this kind of blended or hybrid format that I think a lot of us are moving to. So, um, you know, maybe, maybe you want to save your class time when you're face-to-face -face, um, for activities and group projects. Maybe Maybe you don't want to spend that valuable time just standing up there lecturing. Um, this is a great way for you to take your lectures, um, post it to Blackboard, and still ensure that your students are actively engaged with it. Um, let's see. Another option that we have is um, concept tests. So this is kind of a, a wild idea. Um, and I do, I did pull this from a website. This is not my own original idea, so I'll be happy to share that link with you um, as well in the follow-up email. But a concept test is this idea that 
you present new information to your students. Um, so maybe you've been lecturing, you've presented this new concept, um, and then immediately following that, you ask them for um, some questions to see, you know, do they grasp the concept? Do they fully understand it? And a great thing that you can do is if you have students who have different understandings of the concept, um, you can pick two of them um, to defend their um, to defend their response to that question that you just asked. Um, and their goal is they have to convince the other students in the classroom that they're right. So um, you know, again, it's that idea that you don't always have to do all the teaching. Your your students can teach each other. So um, I, I do kind of like this idea. You know, if you have two opposing viewpoints, um, let each one have equal floor space. You know, defend their response um, and, and see if they can convince their peers that they've arrived at the correct conclusion. So definitely something that you could do. Um, whether that's something that you're doing as a Blackboard activity or, again, in a face-to-face -face classroom scenario. Lots of different options for how you could implement it. And uh, the last one that I had is ePortfolios. So typically, ePortfolios operate um, in one of two ways. Either it's a culminating project for um, the end of a course, so towards the end of this uh, semester, you might ask students to gather uh, together, you know, original coursework that they've generated over the course of the semester um, and put it together kind of as a, a culminating final portfolio. Uh, but we also see it as a culminating project sometimes for entire departments. So um, in which case they would then gather together different pieces of coursework that they've, that they've uh, put together over the course of their their entire program. It could come from different classrooms. It could be different types of things. It could be essays. It, it could be, again, there's so many different majors. I, I don't want to lean out. Um, could be actually art, art, all sorts of things. Um, so as far as e-portfolios are concerned, you know, this is again something that we can help you with. Um, Blackboard actually has an e-portfolio tool, and I'm not sure if all of you are aware of this or not, um, but what happens is if you're interested in a portfolio tool, somebody from our department will customize a template for you um, and implement it in your classroom. And students will be required to upload what's called artifacts, which is basically um, student assignments to that portfolio things that they've completed, Blackboard will now go into their portfolio. Um, and it's nice because they can also do reflections. You know, you might say for a final culminating portfolio for your course, um, hey guys, I, I want you to pull together your three best uh, pieces of work from, from this semester. Um, and then they would grab those three pieces, but they would also do a reflection on what they thought they were the best three pieces and what did they learn, and that type of a thing. So uh, we can customize the template just for you. And, you know, if you don't want to do it via Blackboard, you could certainly still do a portfolio um, that's just something that you would physically turn in. I think it was the nursing department that for the longest time was doing a portfolio where students just compiled a binder of all of their different work. So you can make it as complex or simple as you like, um, but again, it's this idea that the students are going back and reflecting on their previous work uh, and pulling it all together. Whew. Okay, that felt like a lot. Anybody else have some type of graded assessments that they, they enjoy or, or something on this list that speaks to them? I think that you raised an important point, Megan, when you were talking about e-portfolios and the fact that they could be used for individual assignments within a course, or they could be used for maybe a capstone type project, or even at the program level, um, as you said, as for instance, for the nursing program. And um, we have extensive use of e -port the Blackboard e-portfolios across campus, so that's a terrific tool. 
Have any of you used the Kaltura quizzes, the tool? I know, Chris, you had said you used quizzes, I think. Have you tried it in Kaltura? Uh, no, I haven't actually. Um, I actually upload all my videos to uh, YouTube uh, just to help with, like, as um, you were saying earlier, with the mobile aspect, so students could watch it on their phones easier, uh, things of that nature. Because I bet most students would have a YouTube app on their phone. So, and then I just do Blackboard quizzes to go along with it. Okay, thanks. Yes, we, we do know that our students love their, their mobile device. We don't always uh, know what kind of you know, device they have or computer, but um, we're kind of at the stage where almost everybody has a cell phone, so it is helpful. And I see a couple of comments coming in here in the chat. So Will says e-portfolios are great for music, whether performances or compositions, any creative works. Oh, I bet you could do a whole bunch of audio files. That would be great. I love that idea, Bill. That's that's creative. And Hall says I never the quizzes, but I but I use that uh, a lot when recording videos. Yes. So that's one of the nice features that Kaltura has to offer. Um, if you're ever uncertain about how to do the um, Kaltura quizzes, uh, feel free just to send me um, either a direct email or I know uh, coming up here in the fall, we're going to start offering more Kaltura quiz um, workshops. So um, I can help you with that. And it is great in a sense of accessibility, yes. Um, one of the things that I do like about our video platform, Kaltura, is that it does provide auto captions and you can even go back in and edit them as well. So um, it's just really nice. We've learned that a lot of students actually will turn off the sound on videos if they can just watch the, the captions. So uh, it's just one more way to appeal to our students, um, you know, and, and work with whatever circumstance they're dealing with. All right. Has anybody ever done the concept tests where you have uh, students defend um, two different uh, points of views and, and see if they can they can convince their peers? Because I really want to try that. I haven't done it, but I'm thinking that when I teach research courses and the students select the the research model, um, you know, they have to be able to defend that. And I always tell them they need to select more than one. And so that might be something they could do. Interesting. Thank you, Megan. Could be great for that uh, public speaking course, too. Mm -hmm. We can have a debate. Might, might ease them into it. That would be perfect for a debate. I definitely okay, need to do that. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> All right. Well, I think I took up about half of the time. So, um, Yvonne, I'm going to turn it over, I think, to you. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, Megan. And thank you all for sharing your expertise in uh, either with the microphone or in the chat. And now we're going to talk about creative activities and talk about how they can be used to build engagement. And to give you a, a foundational perspective, I wanted to provide a continuum that shows that active learning techniques, um, you want to make sure that you think about the level of complexity of the active learning technique in terms of the level of um, cognitive load and cognitive um, complexity that you're going to ask because the activity needs to be appropriate for the level of cognition that you expect. You might have a, a simple one minute paper writing um, assignment that they do at the end of class that is something quick that doesn't require extensive um, understanding of complex knowledge in your discipline but then as you scaffold your course and it becomes more complex, 
then the top level of that continuum and the highest level of the complexity would be those experiential learning type of, of um, activities or theater or something of that nature. So think about the type of activity and the complexity, the level of knowledge that you're expecting when you're selecting these activities. And I, there are many, many, many activities that you can use. And I wanted to select a few that would connect with the di disciplines of people in this session and that might be a little bit um, different. And the flip activity is, it represents focus on your students' learning. And the idea behind this flip activity is that it takes 10 minutes or less. And the reason that you want to use an activity that takes 10 minutes or less is that you're trying to get them involved in that process of, of reviewing the information, connecting, um, analyzing. And, but you don't want to redesign your whole course to be a flipped classroom type model. But what you do is you you select one activity and then you um, focus on that. And so you might have them read information outside of class and then you would have an activity in the class. And so you flipped that activity rather than the whole, the whole um, course. Has anybody used flipped classroom in their, in their class where, um, I know Chris, you had said you have asynchronous. Um, but so flipped is when the students, they, they do the reading, get familiar with the, the content, and then in the actual session, whether it's synchronous or face-to-face, -face, they, um, you take them more in depth and you have them do activities. Um, has anybody done that? Use a flip type of a model for their class? Some people use it, but everyone doesn't. Robert, you said you're an incoming uh, master's student. Have you ever been in a class where they use that flip model where you read most of the content outside of class and then the activities were in the class and it kind of built upon, it kind of focused on those more complex issues? Did you ever experience uh, that as a student? Yes, I did. Um, and it's, I think it's, it's, a, it's actually pretty valuable. Um, because I think it really puts on the student to really understand the concepts coming in, in um, into the class. So you're not spending all that time lecturing, and you really and you really get to know other students in the class. So it's a really good social activity um, as well. I think so. Um, so yeah. Okay. Thank you. So it helps build that community in the class too. Great. Thank you. And so if you don't want to um, take the time or don't have the time to completely flip your class, you can think about techniques you could use in 10 minutes or less. You might ask the students what's missing. You could show them a list of concepts or terms or a diagram. Megan was talking about concept maps. You could show them a concept map with a piece missing or something that's out of order or a series of steps and then have them identify what's missing or, or is it in the incorrect order or something like that. Um, so that's something that you could do uh, quickly and it, it's kind of a, a formative assessment type of activity that can show you the level of, of understanding that students have about that topic that you're discussing. And another activity that you can do in 10 minutes or less is an aha wall and students might watch a video or or participate in a lecture and then you encourage them to write these aha moments um, you can use Padlet which is a free digital bulletin board which I've used but I used up my free <laughs> my free subscription but um, you can create a Padlet and then you could have the students write their aha moments on that. And so you're, 
you're kind of crowdsourcing their information and you'll have every student's um, responses on there and it's kind of interesting to kind of see that that develop in the class so they watch this video or they participate in a lecture and you know what kind of jumped out at them what were they surprised about or, or what didn't they understand or um, what was one of those light bulb moments and then another activity you could do in a 10 minutes or less is a brainstorming challenge and this might be at the the very beginning of some type of concept that you're going to be talking about. Have them challenge them to generate as, as many um, ideas about that concept, about that topic, as possible. And you can have them. Uh, you can use dice and roll the dice, and then they have to um, generate however many um, ideas are on on the die that they're rolling. And they um, are supposed to each come up with. You could have them as small groups, and they're supposed to each come up with at least 10 ideas. But um, you want them to kind of take the brainstorm and then categorize it into just some, some main themes, just some chunkable concepts. And it sort of provides a foundation for getting their thoughts generated for the next topic that you're going to, going to talk about. And case studies and simulations, I know that a lot of disciplines use those. And in looking at the, the disciplines we have in this group today, I know um, health, interdisciplinary health sciences, uh, you probably use case studies. Um, what other disciplines in here use case studies and simulations? Um, do you see them coming up, Chris in kinesiology, or Robert in communication, or Bill in music? Uh, not as much in my class, uh, if I have to be honest. It's probably more of like the athletic training uh, uh, faculty that do more so the case studies and simulations. As close okay. to mine, mine's more focused on the basic science. Okay, so so you're getting they're getting the foundational science in your course, Chris, and then subsequently they would be applying using that to build upon um, and apply it in more complex um, assignments later in their curriculum. Okay, that makes sense. Great. And Bill said not in music. Okay. And Nahal, you use a lot of case studies and simulations. And Nahal, when you're using a case study and a simulation, how would that, um, okay, so you're from rehabilitation counseling. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, so how do those case studies help those students stay engaged and, and reach those deeper levels of, of learning in your rehabilitation counseling courses, Nahal? Yes, can you guys hear me? Yes, you sound great. Guys, can you hear me? Yes, okay. we can hear you. Um, so, yeah, with the case studies, um, okay, great. Um, so, with the case studies, a week ahead, I usually post a case study, related case study to the concept. And then the students have one week to complete the case study. And then um, during the COVID, for example, I posted a case study so that the students have time to complete that uh, one another's response to the case study. Um, so that when we go back to the class, all of us had already reviewed one another's responses. Um, so that we could have a in-class discussion. Is though is that um, you know I try to cho choose those case studies which is uh, which gives everybody the sense of belonging. You know, um, and I try to develop those in terms of diversity and multiculturalism so that everybody in the class could um, 
you know, understand what's going on. And um, that gave the students a great opportunity to hear different responses um, and understand different points of view, if that makes sense. Yes, that those are, are great um, examples of how how we can use activities and so you're using a case study or a simulation to have students analyze something that's applicable to the discipline and an important topic and building it in such a way that helps to bring connections with the students building that community that's come up several times in our discussion today and bringing in that culturally responsive teaching and um, diversity and inclusiveness is these activities can can help with all of that so those are great examples thank you thank you Nahal and then for okay Megan yes I was just gonna say I heard recently um, you know I, I think of learning activities as any opportunity we have with our students, maybe just for them to build connections between, you know, what they're learning and, and maybe even their own lives. Um, we never know when those connections will take place. But um, I learned recently that there was a um, history instructor at NIU who received a, a special grant um, and she was able to purchase um, virtual reality goggles. I mean, I know this is kind of extreme, but um, again, she, she was completely shocked. She didn't know that she was even going to be approved for the grant. She thought it was a long shot. Um, but as she was teaching her students, you know, about these horrible tragedies that have happened in the past, she was trying to, you know, help them connect that to their own personal lives. What would it feel like? Um, so when she got these virtual reality goggles, her students um, came in and um, they got to um, experience a simulation where they um, were trying to survive a um, a, nat a natural disaster, and I don't know what they were. I think they, oh gosh, I don't know if it was like an earthquake or what, um, but uh, they actually got to kind of experience, you know, a simulation of what they were studying. I just thought it was such a wild one. That's a terrific example. Thank you. That is that is an excellent example of how you can use technology and in in a to address a topic that would be difficult um, to actually experience. That's terrific. Thank you, Megan. It reminds me of a student I, I had in a research course who was, she was going to research how to provide support for people who work in those disaster areas, and I could see this helping, helping with her studies. Thank you. Oh, and I'll just put in there, uh, we did a simulation activity as well, like living with a wheelchair, right? Like, the hands-on experience where they can, you know, just kind of maybe emotionally connect to what they're learning. Yes, and, and research shows that when they do emotionally connect and they experience that learning, they remember it and um, much longer. Um, excellent. Thank you so much. And now we'll talk just a, a minute about lectures for large classes. Um, you know, we know that there are different um, challenges with teaching large classes, and there are many ways that you can engage students, and um, it, it needs to be thought thoughtfully um, constructed. You need to, to carefully think about the activity, the topic that you're focusing on, what are those learning objectives that you really want to focus on in this activity, and plan for, um, create a lecture plan for that active learning in a large class. And one of the ways that you can do that is um, you can ask a question, you know, you talk about um, some topic, and then ask a question and you might have a handout um, and you can post these in Blackboard, you wouldn't have to print them out. Um, you could do this in an online class in a synchronous session, or you could do this in a face-to-face -face class session. So you ask a question, you either have it a handout, or you can have a clicker. Um, does anybody in the session use those eye clickers or any other kind of a polling system in their classes? Okay, it doesn't look like it. Um, Megan, go ahead.
Uh, Megan, did you have a, um, something to add? I didn't. I sorry. Okay. I, I was. Oh. <laughs> no, it's I fine. Thank you. I lost my screen there. Sorry, oh, okay. I forgot to lower my hand. Sorry about that. No, it's fine. Okay, so you ask a question, and um, then you have the students think or analyze um, this question. And I would recommend having them do this individually first, because it provides um, students that have different preferences for how how they um, analyze information or learn information, and um, give them a few moments to think and analyze the question, and then have them discuss. You want to have some interaction built in, and you could have them interact with peers, maybe people who are in close proximity in a large class, or you could use breakout groups in a, a synchronous class session. You can have them respond to you as the instructor. You can think about how you, your TA, your teaching assistant, might help in this process to keep that discussion going. And if students haven't completely um, analyzed it or haven't figured out all those main points that you were trying to get at in terms of the learning objectives, then you take their answers and then you explain and build upon that. But the, the key point is that you structure these activities and you have a plan for the learning and that it makes sense, that it, it's clear to the students that this activity relates to the learning objectives and it makes sense to them. And I always explain to my students why we're doing this particular activity. For instance, I teach a research course and, and we do this biographical exercise activity. And I explain to them that the purpose of this activity is that your own background and your experiences in your life impact your perspectives on research. And so we're studying research. So that's why we're going back and thinking about those major historical events in our lives and, and things like that. So I make sure that, that they understand that this activity directly relates to the, to the learning objectives. Does anybody in here teach large classes? I don't think we have anybody that teaches large lecture halls, but you can use this activity and this plan for small courses too. Ask the question, you can post it on the, the screen, then have them take a moment to think and analyze, then discuss, you want to have, make sure that interaction is going on, and then explain it. So you kind of wrap it all up and summarize it for them. And what we found is there's quite a bit of research that shows that if if you engage students in in these activities and deliberately design your lectures to ask them questions and have them discuss that they're much more engaged and they learn um, and construct knowledge with their peers and they retain the information longer than if they're just listening to a straight lecture and Another option that you can consider for activities is movement. And I know, Chris, you teach kinesiology. Now you were saying it was, was it all online before the pandemic or, or were you just online after the pandemic? Uh, online for the lecture portion of my class. I also have a one hour lab uh, associated with my class as well. And that's been in person uh, ever since we came back for the fall of 20. Okay, okay. Do you do any movement in your labs? Oh yeah, that's pretty much all the lab is, is having students do activities and uh, little to no lecture time at all in the labs. Mm -hmm. And then your labs are aligned with, so you have the, the lectures and they're separate and then you have the corresponding lab and then that aligns with those learning objectives that were addressed in, in the lecture components. Yep, I try my best to have them line up uh, whenever I can, for sure. I definitely mm -hmm. try my best. Mm -hmm. 
and so that's yeah kinesiology so that's perfect that um that you have movement and um megan put in the uh, chat that yes lecture is exhausting and yes and and it is and i incorporate movement you know there's there's research for about how long people can focus um you know in a lecture and there's there's different um numbers of minutes but um if you're going beyond um, 10 or 15 minutes, then uh, you, you need to think about how you're going to incorporate these, these discussions. And I teach um, research courses, and a lot of times they're four-hour blocks of time, and often they're on Saturdays and Sundays and things. And so I make sure to incorporate movement. So I'll have maybe even a simple activity where the students are answering questions or discussing something and maybe they're walking around just in the vicinity of the of the class or in an online class I will get them together with with different students so it's kind of mixing them up to discuss with different people but it gives them a sense that they're that they're moving around but but movement is really important to getting students engaged. And I found this during the pandemic. Um, it was interesting because usually I teach, we have this blended class where we have a residency weekend, the first weekend of January, and that's always in person. And then the rest of it's online. So we move those in-person residency courses to sessions to online. And I found myself during these four hour sessions, standing up and moving my arms and, you know, students, I could see students, you know, so I'd, I'd even say, you know, get up, move, you know, do some jumping jacks or something to kind of, kind of get your blood moving. Um, because it is important for, for people to not be static in, um, you know, it helps their blood get to the brain and all kinds of stuff. So um, there's a tool called Go Noodle activity that, um, can help you find some ways to to engage people and, and bring movement into your classes. Does anybody else use movement just to keep the students engaged? Nahal or Robert um, or Bill? Well, Bill, they're playing the piano, so so they're moving. Um, Nahal, do you use movement in any of your labs? No, not really. Not this one. I never okay. tried. Okay, but you can even just kind of um, sporadically put it in in these online classes. For instance, you could, you know, say do some jumping jacks right now, or just raise your hands above your head um, and move around a little bit. Okay. All right. Yes. I mean, everybody. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, and about then five minutes left. Just to let you know. Okay, great. Thank you, Megan. And then, okay, so Bill said, yes, mu music, you're obviously moving all the time. You teach movement. Oh, okay, great. Um, and so, Bill, when you're teaching movement, what do you, could you just give us a, a real short version of what is, what do you mean? Sure, I'll put my microphone on. Um, when you're playing the piano, obviously you have to move your whole body, actually, but you, I'm sure you know at least fingers and hands and arms have to move, but your whole body moves. So I demonstrate by, by, by how I move, and then I let them try things out. Everybody's different, but um, it's, it's real important how you move. So and if I see something, I observe them playing, and if I see something that's uh, negative for it, <laughs> getting the right sound from the type of movement they're doing. So uh, then I I show them how to change it. Oh, that's terrific. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that, Bill. Just so playing that musical instrument is part acting and part um, athletics and uh, all kinds of stuff that was into it. Everything goes into it. Yes, yes. Thinking and feeling and movement. That's great. Thank you, Bill. Yep. Okay, and then the, the last example that I had was there were some tools that you can use for um, students providing animated responses. 
So it's it's more engaging than than just typing a response. There's Voki, which is V-O-K-I, or Powtoon, or Storyboard, um, Storybird. These are ways that students can create their responses in, they have a voiceover, an animated type of a character. And so it brings in a little bit of, of um, different type of activity, engagement, and kind of builds their enthusiasm. So um, are there any final thoughts on activities or assessments in terms of the uh, topics that we discussed today? We have about three minutes left. So does anybody have anything to add before we close out the session? Um, Yvonne, I think one that I maybe forgot to include is this idea that you can always bring in um, experts in your field into the classroom. I, I know that goes over really well with students. Um, one example that I I'd, uh, heard about is students were taking um, a business course and they were learning about advertising. Uh, students were divided up into groups and each of each group was assigned a different product and they needed to come up with an advertisement for their product and uh, they brought in you know subject matter experts from the field um, advertising executives etc um, and the students actually competed against each other kind of like a, a shark tank experience uh, to see who came up with the best advertisement so um, you know that that also again takes some pressure off of you um, as far as having to lecture all the time. Um, so I, sorry, I forgot to throw that on there earlier. That sounds like it would be a very engaging and, and fun activity. And, and it's authentic because that's actually what happens in the business um, discipline. That's great. Thank you, Megan. Okay, um, no, no apologies necessary. Um, yeah, nope, it's all good. Okay, well, we would, Megan, do you have anything else to add before we um, wrap up today? Uh, no, this session's been recorded, so, um, you know, I'll try to get this out to you today, but realistically, it probably will be tomorrow. Um, so I will send everybody a follow-up email with a link to our recording, um, as well as some of those um, extraneous resources um, that I'd like to share with you. And if you have any questions, you know, please feel free to follow up uh, with either of us. Yes, thank, thank you all so much. And um, we wish you a fantastic summer semester. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you.